afternoon. Uh, welcome to the, the Simons Institute. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett. I'm the Associate Director here. And uh, thanks for joining us for this uh, Richard M. Karp Distinguished Lecture. Uh, this is a series we established to celebrate the role of, of Dick Karp in um, uh, theoretical computer science. He was the founding director of the Institute. Um, it's a series that features visionary leaders in that field and in neighboring areas. Uh, and it's geared towards a broad scientific audience. Uh, and we're grateful to the many contributors to the Richard M. Karp Fund who made this series possible. So I'm delighted to welcome our speaker today, Wilfred Gungo. Uh, Wilfred is professor of mathematics at UCLA. He's made uh, important contributions in optimal transport, calculus of variations and partial, partial differential equations. Uh, and we're thrilled to have him in Berkeley this semester for the program on geometric methods in optimization sampling. Uh, Wilfred's a fellow of the American Mathematical Society. He was a chancellor's professor at UC Berkeley in the math department uh, in 2018 and 19. He's been an Eisenbud chair at MSRI he serves on the scientific advisory boards of the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences and of the MSRI, uh, and he's been an NSF program director. Uh, he's also been very active in mentoring roles, most recently in co-founding with Jelani Nelson and Todd Coleman, the uh, David Blackwell Summer Research Institute. So this is a program for undergrad students that aims to increase the number of students, in particular African-Americans, uh, in top-level mathematics. And his talk today is entitled on some optimization problems involving a large number of matrices. Please join me in welcoming Wilfred Gungma. Thank you. It is a great pleasure and uh, an uh, honor to talk here. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me. So when I hear uh, Peter comment, um, very positive comment. At some point, I start wondering who he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my talk is based on a joint work with uh, David Jekyll. And uh, Dima. Flashenko. Dima is my colleague. Uh, it is possible that I miswrite his uh, last name. I'm sorry about that. And uh, this is about uh, optimal transportation, non commutative. Uh, optimal transportation. So uh, I want to warn you that uh, if you try to make a parallel between what I am, uh, I'll be saying and what you know about uh, optimal mass transportation, uh, you are going to confuse your, yourself. So <laughs> yes, so on one hand, you have a classical mechanics. which correspond to optimal mass transport. And on the other hand, you have a quantum mechanic. Where things are non commutative And here you have a particle in motion. And there you have a state in the space. Quantum systems are represented by state in a Hilbert space. I will list some example. Uh, very soon. And uh, in the case of classical mechanic, you have random variable. Uh, 
where you assume that uh, you are given a set and the probability measure. So this is an atomic measure space. And all the atomic measure space are the same. There is an isomorphic between the atomic measure spaces. And so the one you choose doesn't matter. You can choose the same one to describe your phenomena. And uh, here you have uh, the random variable will be replaced by a bounded operator. On a Hilbert space. So there is uh, no reference Hilbert space, which will work to describe uh, everything. So it is not uh, like uh, here. And uh, the analog of uh, L2 omega RDP, this Hilbert space H will be replaced by uh, collection. of Fulman algebra. So if you look at uh, a description I am making uh, here, and uh, you try to map it uh, here, uh, there is not such an analogy, except uh, in uh, special cases. When I am dealing with operator which commute, we can write an explicit relation between this and that. But when the operator don't commute, there is no such a relation. So let me start with an example. Of a quantum system. So my Hilbert space H will be P to the power N. And the set of bounded operator, linear bounded operator on H, I am going to identify it with a set of uh, N by N matrices with a uh, complex number entries. And uh, I am going to assume that uh, I am given S1, SD in uh, MNC. And I will always assume that uh, they are self adjoint. Even if sometimes I may forget that, but I will always be working with self, self adjoint uh, operator. Now, here you see D operator and N. This D is never going to change. This is what is going to change. This is what is going to go to plus infinity. So the analogy here is uh, I may working with a, with a measure which are average of N Dirac masses. And when I let N go to infinity, I get uh, all the measure. And uh, the, the measure are supported by RD. So this RD correspond to that uh, D. So you can make the following observation remark. This remark is meant to say that uh, when I use the tracer later, it is not something I choose by accident. I don't have many choices. If you look for tau, which are from M and C into C, which are linear, and satisfy the property tau of m is uh, tau of m bar. Tau of one is one. Tau of a b is tau of b a. Tau of a star a is greater than zero with equality 
and only if equal to zero. There are not many uh, tau satisfying this property. There is only one. It is given by tau of A is uh, one over N. This, uh, and so it is the normalized trace. Apply to A. Therefore, once I choose my Hilbert space and I stood the set of bounded operator, I have no choice. If I am looking for a function which satisfy all this property, I have no choice but uh, working with uh, that uh, specific function. Now, when you have uh, a random variable, if I give you this random variable, from the mass transport point of view, you don't need to know everything about the random variable. What you need to know is uh, the push forward of uh, the probability measure. When you are doing mass transportation, that is uh, all that matter. And uh, a way to know the push forward of this is equivalent to when I integrate uh, over omega f s of omega p d omega. If I know this for every f which is continuous, then uh, I know my mu. But by the Weierstrass approximation theorem, if I know this for every polynomial, then I know it for every continuous function. So a measure is completely determined by its moment. Similarly, when I am given this uh, quantum system, S1, Sn, tau n, When I'm given this uh, quantum system, I am going to assume that uh, not a full information is available to me. What is available to me is the moment of this map. So what I mean is uh, I only know the trace of uh, SI1 to the power K1, SIL to the power KL for I1, I L between one and uh, D. And uh, for K J, so rephrasing, I am saying that uh, to each polynomial, non commutative polynomial of D variable, I know the map uh, lambda S of P which is defined by the trace of uh, P of S. And uh, I am going to call S1, SD. These are the non-commutative. Random variables. And uh, lambda s will be the non-commutative law. So we want to understand uh, a little bit uh, what information have we collected uh, here. So let us take uh, the, the case uh, d equal to Let us take the case of D equal to one. Equal to one. 
then uh, we set of uh, lambda s such that uh, s is in mn c this is the set of one over n from j from one to n delta lambda j s where lambda j s are the eigenvalues So from what you see here, the dimension may disappear because uh, if I take a twice the dimension and I sum up it is possible that uh, I repeat, it is possible that I use a matrix where the eigenvalue are repeated. And so when I look at uh, what I get, I don't see the dimension. All I see is the measure. So the point I am trying to make is uh, two quantum systems which come from uh, two different dimensions may still be compared. So I want to compare quantum system even if they don't have the same dimension. Another case of which is remarkable is uh, assume that uh, the commutator of S I S J are zero for every I J. Then you can define a measure mu S defined by the integral over R D of a mu dx f of x is uh, the trace n of uh, f of s for every f polynomial. And again, since uh, I can approximate uh, every continuous function by polynomial in the commutative case, I am defining uh, a measure here. And uh, one can uh, write a correspondence between uh, the set, uh, one can write a correspondence between the set uh, of uh, lambda s such that s are commuting and uh, the set of probability measure on uh, Rd. So this is with, with uh, uh, I am hiding something uh, here. Since my S have a, a, a bounded operator, then the, me the measure will be supported by uh, the ball of uh, radius, whose radius is given by the operator. So it will not be the set of probability measure. It will be the set of probability measure with compact support. So here is uh, what I want to do. I am given two quantum system and uh, I want to say how dissimilar they are. So I want to find a criteria to decide uh, uh, what I mean by them being dissimilar. And uh, what was proposed by Bian and Voiscolescu, they propose a metric on a set so you can make the following observation remark if lambda is either lambda s or lambda t, it satisfies the following property, lambda of one equal to one. Lambda of pq is lambda of qp. Lambda of p star p is greater than equal to zero. 
And uh, if I set set R to be the maximum of uh, the operator norm of SJ, J from one to B, you can check that uh, lambda of S I one. S I K is less than R to the power K for every I1 I K. And uh, when lambda satisfies that property, I write the following notation lambda is a sigma D R, D for the dimension, and the R to say. Uh, what is the support, what will correspond to the support of my measure. And uh, sigma D will be the union R greater than zero, sigma. So definition, design with Olescu. metric. Is a metric which is defined on that set. So let uh, lambda naught, lambda one, be in a sigma dr. So if it, if they are here for r large enough, it means that uh, they are in sigma dr, and define pi of lambda naught, lambda one to be the set of tau in sigma 2D with the following property, tau of P, tensor product identity is lambda naught of P and the tau of identity tensor product Q is lambda one of Q. And uh, this must be true for every P, which is in C S1. SD and for every Q, which is in C, S D plus one, S two D. Then the distance square between lambda naught, lambda one, is by definition the infimum over tau in pi lambda naught, lambda one, the sum j from one to d, and the tau of uh, x uh, j minus, uh, let me write it uh, this way, xj minus sj plus d, the norm with respect to tau square, where by definition, the norm of a tau is uh, tau of a star, a square. And you can check that uh, this is uh, a metric and they have uh, the following theorem. Solve this one. One is a minimum. If S one, S D, T one, 
CD are in M and C are self adjoint. And the commute SJ S equal to zero TJ. Then the distance, well, a school distance between lambda S and lambda T is the vast sustained distance between. So this is one of the rare case where you connect with a sustained distance. Maybe, maybe I should not say the rare case. You connect with a sustained distance to the non commutative distance. But there are other cases where, for instance, you are working with large matrices and uh, you impose uh, some density condition on this large, large matrices and you pass to the limit. You can show that uh, such equality hold uh, even uh, if uh, the matrices don't commute. So when you look at this, what is uh, amazing is how short and simple the proof are. So let me give you an idea of the proof from it. So the first one, you check that uh, pi lambda naught lambda one is a compact set. of the point-wise convergence. So the functional to minimize. Is convex, in fact, linear, lower semi-continuous of the topology. And this concludes the fact that you have a, a minimizer. Now for the second part, if they are commuting, you have a, a relation between the trace and uh, the measure mu s. So whenever you take a, an optimal tau, you can construct explicitly the optimal measure in uh, the Wasserstein metric and vice versa. So based on this formula, you can go from one set to another. And uh, so the second part of the proof is uh, also very simple. So this is uh, a this is a special case of uh, what uh, Bian and Voice College School did. I done that because I was trying to postpone as long as possible the introduction of von Neumann algebra. <laughs> because uh, I have a colleague who we were writing a joint report. And when I wrote the von Neumann algebra, he asked me to take that off the report. <laughs> okay, so I have an, an addition and multiplication. We all know what an algebra is. It is close on the addition, it is close on the multiplication. So a star algebra here, the star will be the adjoint to an operator. I, I associate the adjoint of the operator. And uh, so a C star algebra is an algebra which is closer on the uh, this operation plus uh, some condition on the norm, which I am not going to write here. So let's, let me say that uh, definition. A von Neumann algebra is a sister algebra. Contain in BH 
I feel best page eight. So let me call it a von Neumann algebra W. And uh, you impose that uh, such that, such that W is close on the weak operator topology. And one belong to W. So one is the identity mapper here. And of course, uh, uh, the set of uh, matrices uh, is uh, a sister al algebra. So now uh, I can replace uh, in this definition. I can uh, consider lambda from, so I want to define a threshold argument. So I am supposed to say a separable threshold for Neumann algebra, but here I will be working only with for Neumann algebra, which are separable, and I'm just going to use this terminology. So a tau, the threshold for Neumann algebra, if the pre-dual, A. If A star, the pre dual of A is separable. Tau is in the pre dual and satisfy the following property. Tau of one is one, tau of AB is tau of BA, tau of A is, uh, is greater than or equal to zero, and the quality is only if equal to zero. And uh, I am going to use the notation, the norm. That this really gives you a norm, and in fact, you have an inner product which you can guess what it is. So, this theorem is uh, due to. So they prove that uh, the distance between lambda naught and lambda one, if lambda naught, lambda one, I include my D, the distance between them can be obtained by minimizing over Threshold from an algebra A, tau. 
x1, so xy. The norm of x minus y, the tau norm square, subject to the constraint that uh, s1, s d, y1, y d, are self adjoint okay and so you will probably wonder why should i go from such a simple formula to this complicated formula so think about uh, studying an, a hamilton jacobi equation on uh, this set so you don't have any nice uh, geometry structure now, there is a well understood study of Hamilton Jacobi equation on Hilbert space. So, if I can convert everything I have on this space to the Hilbert space, if I can prove existence and unique, uniqueness of solution to my Hamilton Jacobi equation on Hilbert space, I can translate the result on this non flat space and prove uh, existence of solution. So this way of thinking has been successful in the Wasser time space. In the Wasser time space, uh, when you want to solve uh, some equation like uh, the master equation, the way it has been handled so far is uh, to exploit what, what we know about uh, uh, uniqueness comparison principle of, uh, sorry, uh, you don't have comparison principle for the master equation, but you have it for Hamilton Jacobi equation on the non local Hamilton Jacobi equation on the Russell Stein space. So, to prove uniqueness, you exploit the comparison principle on Hilbert space, and then you conclude you have comparison principle on the Russell Stein space. For the master equation, you use the differential structure you have on Hilbert space. You prove the uniqueness of solution. It is not a comparison principle result, but you use the fact that you understand well what a gradient means, what a Hessian means on a Hilbert space, and you convert that to the vast space. So, although I don't think they have this motivation in mind, uh, such a, a result is uh, very useful to go from uh, a flat space, from flat spaces to Places which are not flat. Yes. See where the lambda is not the lambda one is. Yes. Yes. So you are going to impose that uh, they satisfy that property. A, uh, second, just a curiosity: like how how is important that H is finite dimensional? or find a dimensional or is just for the example? Just for the example. H is not a finite dimension and I am going to convince you that uh, you cannot even consider finite dimensional. I mean, in general, you start in a finite dimensional space and you go to infinite dimension. I'm going to convince you in a few minutes. And can, can you also do a similar remark when you are in a finite dimensional, how do you... So does it go exactly the same if you are in finite dimension, don't need to... So whether or, so everything I am doing is a true for any arbitrary Hilbert space, whether it is finite dimension or infinite dimension. Was that your question? Yes, no, what I was wondering is like more the definition of the couplings. Yes. If this goes like uh, exactly in the same way, if you go to the infinite dimension. Because this, this part doesn't see the dimension, right? This part I am working, uh, on uh, the set of non-commutative polynomial. Ah, because we also have bounded operators. Okay. Yes. I see. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So if you are calculus, calculus of variation person of like me, and you see this minimization problem, you pass to the minimizing sequence, you want to prove compactness and the proof existence of uh, a minimizer, and probably 10 years later, you are still trying to find out if you can prove compactness <laughs> and you'll not be able to. But uh, some figure, some figure uh, very amazing uh, happen. So in uh, the classical case, 
If I give you any probability measure, you can say it comes from a random variable. And here the same is true. If I give you any tau, if I give you any lambda or tau, you can say that it comes from a Feynman Newman algebra. So this uh, variational problem, there is something called the Gelfand. My mark. Construction. which says the following, given any lambda, which is in sigma dr, there exists a threshold for human algebra. A tau and uh, S1, SD, which are self adjoints, such that lambda equal to lambda S. So you can show that uh, every time I give you an A tau SY, you can construct. Uh, um, this is not uh, a good idea. Let us call this bar, bar. If every time I give you a bar here, you can construct an element here. And uh, this uh, GNC construction tell you that uh, conversely, when you are given any tau here, you can say that they come from a full Newman algebra. So the fact that you can go this way, tell you that this infimum is bigger than that one. And this construction tell you that uh, when I find my infimum here, I can construct a Feynman algebra and show that my infimum is uh, achieved. Now, here is uh, something, one of the first results uh, we got. For any n greater than 11, if you set a d to the n square and you choose arbitrary d integer, we can find that. m. <laughs> We can find the uh, S1, 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 D, M, N, C, step by doing, such that call this a two. If A is the optimal. If a tau is optimal, is the optimal in two, the dimension of two, and so you cannot say that when you start uh, in a certain dimension, you stay there. Your dimension can go as high as possible. Now we have uh, the following result. There is something which is called the cone embeddable problem. 
So the code embeddable problem, roughly speaking, in some particular case, tell you that if I, if I have any lambda in sigma dr, can I write it as a limit of lambda n, where these are produced by a finite dimensional commutative law? So an answer to cone embeddable problem, a negative answer was announced. It is not published yet. It is still uh, uh, on the archive. And uh, our theorem will be if the non-negative answer to, cone, to the cone embeddable. Your problem is, is confirmed. We can take cross infinity. Therefore, you can choose the two finite uh, system, and the optimal one has to be of uh, infinite dimension. So it is written, there is a written rule somewhere in the Bible of the calculus of variation saying that if you have a optimal transport, there must be a Benamou Brunier formulation. So let me define the analog of a gradient very easy to, to define. So if I give you formula, if I give you P, a polynomial of uh, the variable, and I write, ask you to write a P of uh, X plus epsilon W, you are going to write that it is P of X plus epsilon, something of order one in W and so on. So if I ask you to write the trace, you are going to write that uh, this is the trace. And uh, remember that the trace, if I do A1, AK, it is cyclical. This trace of AK, A1, AK minus one and so on. So the W which appear, I can always switch them so that uh, they appear at the end. And uh, this can be written epsilon trace of an explicit operator, which uh, anybody can write, multiply by W plus little o of epsilon. And uh, this, is, this operator is called the cyclical, the cyclic derivative. <clears throat> so, given a path, if t goes to lambda t is an absolutely continuous path, So an absolutely continuous path on a metric space is uh, the distance that exists beta in L2, zero t, such that the distance between uh, lambda s, lambda t, lambda s, lambda t, is less than the integral from s to t, beta of tau, d tau, for every s and t. So if you have such a path, which satisfy this regularity property, you can define the Hilbert space H lambda t. You can define it to take the closure. I am going to take the set of polynomial. Uh, 
I am going to caution by lambda t p star p equal to zero because if I don't caution the lambda t will correspond to a semi norm, but if I caution it will correspond to a norm, and I am going to close this with respect to lambda t. And so the theorem is. Uh, If lambda zero, lambda one uh, in sigma, yeah. then the distance between lambda zero, lambda one square is the infimum, the integral from zero to one, the integral over lambda and V. T lambda t square dt subject to the condition that lambda zero is lambda naught and lambda one is lambda one. And uh, we satisfy the continuity equation d over dt lambda t of p equal to lambda t dp dt in the sense of distribution. For every p polynomial. So I think uh, I am going to stop uh, here. My uh, 15 minutes are up. Thanks very much. Questions? So how does this relate to kind of the description uh, by uh, Carlin and Mass of uh, uh, also the Venom Brainier in the, the spaces of operations as well? Yes. So Carlin and Mass, well, Mass are transporting one operator to one over one. However, they constructed a metric which is a specific. So they wanted to study some uh, specific focal Planck equation. So they constructed a, a metric such that uh, with, res with respect to that metric, the uh, focal Planck equation is a gradient flow for that metric. Now, uh, these are not uh, comparable because uh, for instance, here I am, I am telling you that in some situation, I can say that uh, when things commute, then this is uh, the Wasserstein distance, the classical Wasserstein distance. But uh, the mass Carlin or Brunier, or also I have a paper with Tanabam, Chena, and uh, Trifon. In uh, this case, it's, uh, you don't relate data to the classical Wasserstein distance. So these are different, completely different metrics. So the four groups, Constructed four different metrics. Thanks. Uh, in the like in the context of random matrices. Second question is like, um, uh, is there a notion of cyclical monotonicity or so that you're here with um, your natural reading? Like, okay. So for the, for the first question, this in fact is uh, one of my motivation. Um, I want to look at the game where the game are, are described by finitely many random matrices. 
and I want to let uh, the size of matrix go to infinity and see what I get. So this is a still a very long shot. This has been done. There is something which appear a lot in the literature, which is Dyson game. In the case of Dyson game, D equal to one. And so that has been done a lot with D equal to one. Now D greater than one, it is a hope that something can be done and this is, uh, this is uh, the motivation. Now, regarding your second question, what you do is uh, you convert everything you have uh, to the Hilbert space. And on the Hilbert space, uh, you, use your, you have a notion of convexity. You impose that the converged function you are dealing with satisfy Jensen inequality. So you can define an, uh, a conditional expectation every time you have uh, a trace. And you impose that you are dealing with a converse function which satisfies Jensen inequality. And uh, uh, you replace, so cyclic monotonicity is equivalent to uh, convexity, right? And so you have uh, the analog to the Hilbert space formulation. Yes. You mentioned that for, for any random variable, you know, complexly supported random variable in R, you can come up with these um, operators to make that the, the corresponding random variable. So if I had some pure state, uh, you know, some wave function I was interested in, how would I come up with these operators to get that to be my, you know, would, would, would operators correspond? Um, could you come up with operators to correspond to a, your favorite wave function? So what you see as an operator is, for instance, uh, you take the universal Laplacian. Right? So the universal Laplacian, I am working with bounded operator. And uh, one typical operator you can think about is uh, the inverse Laplacian on the torus, for instance. Or you can think about the multiplication operator, the operator where you multiply everything by uh, a, a function. Or you can discretize uh, the inverse Laplacian to get a finite dimensional operator. So this would be able to give you sort of a distance between two wave functions. So it seems to me that your wave function will be the state, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your wave function, whereas I am, def I am defining distances between the operator, not between the state. I guess I was, I was trying to reconcile with the way I, I always thought of, of random variables, quantum random variables, which is like, you know, it could be this quantum state or it could be this other quantum state, basically like a mixed state. I was wondering if there's a parallel. So I can also use a sum, uh, for instance, if you give me an element of the Hilbert space, I can construct an operator from there, right? The projection, for instance. Uh, that would be that would be a very particular operator, and uh, yes, maybe from uh, there you can try to to compare uh, state because you are associating the operator to them. So maybe one more question. Yeah. Can you say something about like the dual formulation about the, the of these? So let me say something about uh, how to change what you are asking me is. Uh, this is what you are asking me because the term uh, sum of uh, SI square will be independent of the tau. And so, you can show that uh, this is uh, the supremum over lambda naught of f. 
cos lambda one of t and uh, g is the family t a from uh, Phenomenal algebra, sorry, convex, and F is FA, FA from the Phenomenal algebra. And I'm going to impose that GA of Y plus FA of X are greater than the inner product XY. For every x and y, and by definition, this is uh, you can show that it is independent of a. So you can show that. Uh, if I am given an S bar and Y bar such that lambda naught is lambda S bar and lambda one is lambda Y bar, you can show that this is independent of uh, S of, of A. And so that uh, expression makes sense and you maximize this under this condition, which is like uh, what you do in the classical case. All right. If there are other questions, I'll let that go. Join me in thanking Wilfred again for the.